we try to do this with uh, some, some technology. Um, I practice it and it works, so yeah, if anything goes wrong, please just go with me. So I'm going to talk about puns in the pyramid text. Um, the, the first question to ask is, what do I mean by pun? So today we think of puns as being jokes, but in languages of the ancient Near East, puns were actually used in much more serious contexts, especially in religious texts. So I should clarify from the beginning that the puns in the pyramid text are not meant to be funny. Instead, they sort of emphasize the deep natural and supernatural relationships underlying the power of these texts. <coughs> While it's important to acknowledge the distinction between ancient and modern usage, I would also like to point out that this difference is in the sharpest you may think. In both cases, the purpose of the pun is to highlight a surprising and unexpected connection between two different ideas. In the context of a joke, the result is humor. While in religious texts, the result is a profound sense of awe. The difference between them lies in the delivery and the presentation. In the pyramid text, the presentation couldn't be more formal, and the words themselves, the words themselves possess a powerful measure. The strength of the association between the corpus of Egyptian funerary texts, of which the pyramid text represents the earliest incarnation, and the magical powers is, and magical powers is exemplified by evidence from Coptic where the gem metric formula has survived in the word gem tau, which came to have a very restricted meaning of wizardry or magic. In this example from the Lenar's Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 14, the word gem tau is clearly associated with the word shishang, meaning to take omens or to divine. So the pyramid texts are magical and performative speech and to have power over the gods themselves. It is unlikely to find puns being used for humor in this context. Instead, the wordplay found in the pyramid text adds a sense of solemnity to the recitation and provides a compelling rational basis for the mythological association that they will learn the properties. So the next question to ask is, what does an ancient Egyptian pun actually look like? The use of puns was pretty common in ancient Egyptian, and in fact, you probably come across some of them without really even noticing. Um, one of my favorite examples is the nine bows, which uses the juxtaposition of two words to create a um, very instantaneous sort of wordplay. So you can see the Egyptian transcription of Peju, Pesaju, and then I've also added a sort of pseudo-Coptic translation of this that shows just how similar these words might have sounded when spoken aloud, Pita Sinta. So for this paper, I compared the use of puns in other languages of the ancient Near East, but they're also extremely common. The most useful comparison came from Arabic, and the various... Could you stand closer to the microphone, please? Thank you. Um, did everybody get everything before? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> this is my second, second talk, so it's not great. Um, so probably the most useful comparison came from Arabic, and the various usages of work they found in the Quran. Um, these have been very extensively categorized and studied over the, over the years. And I originally formed my own expectations of what I would find in ancient Egyptian based on the examples that I found in the Arabic and the Quran. Um, however, a survey of this material is much too involved for a short talk. So instead, to introduce you to puns in Egyptian, I decided to choose a few examples from a Coptic text, um, which is it's a bit of an odd text. It's usually classed among the Gnostic text called Thunder Perfect Mind. Um, this text is remarkable for its pervasive use of wordplay, and it also bears, it often bears a striking resemblance to wordplay found in the pyramid texts, which were composed more than 2,000 years before. First example shows the use of consonants. Um, in the Coptic, you have imperpot and soli, impento, imet, and mal, and ol. So the use of the ball for eyes, instead of another word, or another more common word for sight, seems atypical. But it can be explained by the wordplay ball creates with the following word in whole. In the second example, the alternation of phi and shy create a repetitive effect which mimics a sort of weak consonance. So this would have sounded something like petef bush, shaf shobe, and moe. The third and final example demonstrates another case of consonance. The bone can she be shot and um, here, shibe and shot in the first line are clearly paired, and the rest of the phrase continues the repetition of shibe to further emphasize this connection. As these, 
as these examples indicate, not only is wordplay present in text spanning the entire corpus of, or the entire history of, of the written Egyptian language, but there's also a strong tendency for these usages of wordplay to, re to rely on consonantal roots and vowel prosody in the creation of punning pairs. So this suggests that the same sort of punch should be visible to us when they are present in earlier stages of Egyptian, because the exact things that puns are made of are things that we have visible to us still. Um, so collecting these examples might provide a closer look at vocal paradigms underlying their consequences. So before I go any further into what I believe puns are doing, it is first necessary to establish their presence within this corpus and propose an, an objective means for identifying them. In any text of sufficient length, it is inevitable that similarly sounding words will appear near one another from time to time by chance alone. So what indications are there that the pyramid text actually contained puns in the first place? How can we hope to find them without running the risk of simply imposing our own expectations onto the data? One very good indication that the use of wordplay was intentional is the tendency for puns to appear in similar structures. The two structures that stand out most are offering formulas and in your name of instructions. In the figure, I've mapped the location of these patterns in the pyramid text. Um, it, the, the figures zoomed pretty far out because there are so many phrases to show. But what you have here is um, each vertical line represents several, sort of the, the average of several phrases. And you have the, the three types that I've identified, um, offering formulas, name formulas, and then other includes any other type of one that I think might exist. Um, so the first type, the offering formula. Um, these are actually the most the easiest to identify because they are clearly visible even without being able to read the text. So they begin with So they begin with some sort of injunction, such as Unis accept Horus's eye, which you should embrace, which is then followed by a physical offering such as one kidney. This pattern is plainly visible, even without reading the text, it's easy to identify the top register, the bottom register, and a clear dividing line separating them. In these cases, the pun uses the phonological similarity of the offering and a keyword in the previous phrase to connect the mundane material of the offering to the sacred text that inspired it. So now I'll go through a few examples of these. Um, in the first example, the word bia, meaning to be far away, is paired with the word bia in the offering, which means metal, and connects the, the meaning of the phrase to the material of the offering. Uh, I think this example is particularly interesting because it demonstrates both a uh, logical, semantic, and mythological connection as well as a possible chronological connection. So, um, very obviously the word, uh, the word breast of Horus is connected to the offering of milk in, you know, in a way that's, that, that's obvious in a very real world sense. But at the same time, there's also a possible connection between ear Eric and ear Chet which, as Coptic shows, would have sounded something like Ergok and Ergok. Um, wordplay involving names appear in many sacred texts from the ancient Near East, and they are also common in pyramid texts. I believe that this sort of wordplay works because we often fail to notice that proper names are usually made up of ordinary words. Once we associate the name with a person or a god, we might fail to notice its more mundane meanings. These puns take advantage of these connections that are usually hiding in plain sight and force us to become suddenly aware of the meaning of the name. And the effect still works on us today. God's names are a frequent source of wordplay, as in this example, where the name of the Nubis is connected with the verb eat, meaning to count or to review. And for a second example, the, the name of the personified son, Ray, is connected with Yah, meaning to ascend. However, this pattern also includes names that seem to have been created extemporaneously, solely for the purpose of creating another pun that fits this pattern. So in this example, you have the word Teruru, meaning to redden, paired with the word Cheret, meaning willow. 
Uh, and Willow isn't, it isn't the name of a god, it isn't really the name of anything. It's being invented here as a name solely to make it a part of the work. So the previous two patterns make up the bulk of the part that I've identified in the paper text. But there are also other cases where wordplay is very clearly present. In this first example, the entire phrase is one big pun, and it's actually a bit of a tongue twister. So, shoes says shoe, shoe. <sighs> So following on that, the next question is, how is this information 